Hi folks, we're just giving a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let folks end tonight's event before we get started. If you are already in tonight's webinar with us, you can open up your chat window and find some information about how to purchase books by tonight's featured authors. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Justin Beale launching his new book, Sand Future, an account of the life and work of the architect Minoru Yamasaki. We'll be talking with Katie Yamasaki, author and granddaughter of Minoru Yamasaki, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Justin, Katie, and the team at the MIT Press for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here, though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Sand Future, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our stores from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., where you can purchase Justin's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop that by link in the chat. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, Buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. In addition, Justin has created a limited edition run of 50 unique prints with 20 available for free to the first 20 people who purchased the book from Greenlight. Make sure to request a signed print in the order comments at checkout if you'd like one included in your order while supplies last. Justin will also be signing and personalizing books, so you can request that on your online order as well. Our interviewer tonight is muralist and children's book artist, Katie Yamasaki. She has traveled widely, painting over 80 murals with diverse communities around the world that explore local issues of social justice. Her children's book work focuses on similar themes of social justice and stories from underrepresented communities. Yamasaki earned her BA from Elmham College and her MFA from the School of Visual Arts, where she served on the faculty for several years. She worked for 14 years as a public school Spanish and art teacher in both the Detroit and NYC public schools. Yamasaki lives in Brooklyn with her family. She'll be speaking with our featured author, Justin Beale, an artist with an extensive exhibition history in the United States and Europe. Graduated from Yale University with a degree in architecture and continued his studies at the Whitney Independent Study Program in the University of Southern California. His work has been reviewed in the New York Times, the New Yorker, Art Forum, Freeze, Art in America, and the Los Angeles Times, and is included in the permanent collections of the Albright Knox Museum, the Hammer Museum, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Beale teaches at Hunter College. His new book, Sand Future, 
is a book about the life of the architect Minoru Yamasaki, who remains on the margins of history despite the enormous influence of his work on American architecture and society. Sand Future is also a book about an artist interrogating art and architecture's role in culture, including reflections on a wide range of subjects from the figure of the architect in literature and film, and transformations in the contemporary art market to the perils of sick buildings and the broader social and political implications of how and for whom cities are built. Justin is gonna start us off with a reading from the book and then he'll be talking with Katie and with all of you. Justin, please take it away. All right, um, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you to everyone at Greenlight. Um, thank you also to everyone at MIT Press since it's the first of official event and to uh, particularly to my editor, Tom Weaver and to John Morgan and Adrian for designing this beautiful book. Um, I, and of course, to Katie for being here with me tonight and, and for so, so much else. Um, I'm going to begin by reading uh, a quick passage that has to do with the critical reception of Yamasaki's work in the middle of his career, but also has something to do with my own arch architectural edu education, and I think will sort of set the stage for discussion. <clears throat> As criticism of Yamasaki's new direction was growing, an irreverent young critic named Otto Louise Huxtable wrote in Art in America that if modern architecture may be said to have already established a tradition, Yamasaki is shattering it. With remarkable sensitivity to the moment, she acknowledged how, to a generation of architects trained on doctrines of ornament is crime, form follows function, and less is more, this is close to aesthetic transgression. Huxtable makes pains to defend a practice which, while deliberately decorative and among professionals highly controversial, is also sensitive, conscientious, exploratory, delicately sensuous, and very beautiful. Within months, Huxtable would assume her post as the first full-time architecture critic at the New York Times, and for the next decade, she would remain a stalwart supporter of Yamasaki's work. Huxtable, however, was increasingly in a minority. The delicacy and ornamentation of Yamasaki's work did not fit easily into the dominant narrative of American architectural history which has generally organized itself around the central virtue of strength. The narrative was largely the construction of architectural historians like Vincent Scully, who arranged the history of American architecture into a seamless monolithic mythology of powerful grounded structures rising up from the earth. The Aztec pyramids at Teotihuacan, the stone skyscrapers of Chicago and the austere concrete minimalism of Louis Kahn. While not the only story of American architecture, Scully's is a monumentally influential one. Scully taught at Yale for over 60 years and published dozens of books based on his lectures. The breadth of his influence on architects, critics, and historians who first saw modern American architecture through his eyes is formidable. Scully's lectures were the first architectural history courses I ever took, and I felt at times as though the entirety of my architectural education was built on the foundation of his worldview not only because he taught me, but because he taught so many of the people who wrote the books I read or taught the courses I took. Scully, nearly 80 by the time I encountered him, with ruffled gray hair and tattered tweed, was the physical embodiment of patriarchal professorial knowledge. He would stand before an enormous auditorium filled to capacity with students and bombard us with a syncopated sequence of side-by-side -side images cast on a screen behind him from dual slide projectors. Each lecture began quietly on a solid historical footing, the Acropolis or a Pueblo village, and built gradually through a progression of steps so deliberate that they felt not only logical, but inevitable. He would bang his broomstick pointer on the floor emphatically, or clench the dais and fight back tears as the lecture reached its inevitable crescendo, advancing images by shouting slide at the graduate student in the projection booth like a sea captain barking orders at his crew. His delivery transformed the loose threads of architectural history embroidered with references to art and literature into matters of thrilling political and intellectual urgency. Like any academic canon, Scully's chronology tells a story, but it's also a story, just a story, and one that favoring cohesiveness over completeness puts undue emphasis on certain accomplishments while omitting others entirely. Despite their shared passion for the architectural virtues of empathy and democracy, Yamasaki did not fit into the story Scully was trying to tell, so he was largely erased from it. Scully dismissed the McGregor Conference Center as a twittering aviary, 
and largely ignored everything that came after it. The more time I spent with the work, the more I understood the extent to which I had to unlearn Scully's particular version of history before I could even begin to look at Yamasaki objectively. Yamasaki's marginalization was not entirely Scully's doing, but the idea of strength deployed in the context of a history that exists almost exclusively within the highly coded spaces of privilege, whiteness, and masculinity inevitably carries the associations of all of its implied opposites. If a building is not strong, it is by implication frivolous, spindly, decorative, feminine, weak, mannered, exotic, or queer. So let's start there. Okay, so um, I think that um, one thing I'd like to talk about a little bit, and this kind of came to me um, when I met with you, but also when I read um, Dale Geyer's um, Dale Geyer's book is, and went to see Dale speak when his book came out, is the idea of of my grandfather's work and our grandfather's work living in um, relative obscurity. So that was something that was really a surprise. And I also just want to say hello to all my family that's on this uh, chat because they're on this um, at this event. There are a bunch of people here, so that's so nice. And when I say my grandfather, I mean our grandfather because there are a bunch of us. But um, I think that like for us growing up. Um, in the Detroit area where he loomed large, it didn't occur to me ever, you know, until fairly recently that his work lived in obscurity. And I wonder if you could kind of um, talk a little bit about that and um, if you could kind of describe why you think that's the case. And if anything, you know, of course, I kind of think about that in terms of race at, in the era that he grew up in and what him being a Japanese American man in this incredibly white space had to do with um, the obscurity of his work and where he stands kind of in history. So maybe we right. can start there. Um, that's like six questions, but sure. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, that was the sort of fundamental, I, starting jumping off point for the book, which is why, you know, thinking about myself uh, in 2001, after I graduated from college, standing at the foot of the World Trade Center and wondering how it could be that I didn't know who designed this building, you know, having just completed a degree in architecture. And, you know, slowly over time, I connected the World Trade Center to your grandfather, but then also to the Eastern Airlines terminal at Logan Airport in Boston, which is a building I'd always loved to the images of Pruitt Igo, which I of course was aware of as a student of architecture, but nobody had ever told me who designed them. But then also to other buildings like uh, the Robertson Hall at Princeton or the Century Plaza Towers in Los Angeles. And you know, when I finally came around to the subject of writing about the book, which happened quite circuitously, I, you know, that was sort of one of the things I was, I was setting out to answer. Um, but I think since you mentioned Dale's book and since Dale is with us tonight, I, I think it's also, you know, that was another key point in this whole process, which was that, you know, I was trying to learn more about your grandfather, but I was also trying to think about how I wanted to write about architecture and how most books, most architecture books that I'd read were not the ones that kind of spoke about architecture in the way I was interested in talking about it. And, and that the books that did speak about architecture in the way that I was interested in were coming from another place. Um, you know, Thomas Mann or, or James Salter, or Teju Cole, like th these other ways of approaching the built environment. Um, and so this is gonna be quite a long answer, but I, I set out on this project at a point in my career as an artist where I felt like I needed to, to move the practice into a different direction. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but um, when I eventually arrived at this idea of writing a book, I, I immediately fell in love with the subject of, of your grandfather and got very excited about writing about it and, and spent several years doing as much research as I could thinking about it in, in all the different possible ways that I could. And then at some point, maybe two years into that process, a, a colleague of mine told me that somebody else was writing this book, uh, of this monograph about Yamasaki. And I, of course, you know, thought uh, to myself, I was like, okay, I've just taken this colossal leap, abandoned 
you know, walked away from my career as an artist to write what I thought was going to be the first book written about this incredibly important figure in 40 years, only to find out that somebody's well ahead of the process in the process. And, and that was Dale. And I was devastated, right? I, you know, it was like for, I, you know, I, for, for a week, I just was completely crestfallen beside myself and just, you know, thought that I'd wasted years. But then, then sort of slowly, I came to realize that that wasn't the book that I wanted to write. And that by writing this incredibly comprehensive, beautiful monograph that Dale made, he sort of took this responsibility off my shoulders of creating a comprehensive history of, of your grandfather's work, which allowed me to explore the, this more open and unconventional way of writing about architecture. Oh, great answer. <laughs> well, we'll get to um, some of the other, there are some other parts of that that I wanna go into, but that kind of takes me to like the structure of your book because it was really unusual. And um, I'm sure most people on the, um, at this event haven't had the chance to read the book yet, but it's wonderful and it's really an unusual structure. And when you told me about it, I kind of had no idea what you were talking about. And I didn't know how you were gonna pull it off in terms of kind of weaving all of these things together, um, weaving together, you know, these bigger concepts of, you know, who occupy, who creates the spaces that we, that we occupy and who gets to decide and, and my grandfather and, and health and um, climate change and the fine art world, all of these different things. I kind of wondered how you're, how you're going to do it. But um, I'm wondering what I, what I love about it is it kind of reminds me of how I feel like I experience architecture and how people who are non-architects, how we experience architecture kind of on a regular basis. It's like our kids' schools or um, the homes we live in or the, you know, the doctor's offices we visit. And, um, but we don't really kind of have much of a say in the construction of those, um, of those projects. So what I loved about it is it kind of felt very like a very democratic way to think about something that's really um, intellectual and often kind of a study out of reach of people who aren't specifically studying architecture. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of talk a little bit about your intention with the structure of the book and like how you broke it up, broke it up. Cause you'll see when you read the book, you know, there's like a, you know, a section on my grandfather followed by the, a section of like your kind of family's health journey followed by a section of like uh, talking about 432 Park Avenue, which we'll get to a little bit later and just kind of all of these different sections and then kind of coming back around again. Yeah, um, good question. I think, you know, I, there's sort of this cliche of architecture always like, you know, they always say architecture is photographed without people in it, right? If you look at an architectural coffee book, if, if there's all these, which, which always struck me, uh, you know, obviously as, as quite absurd because the point of this thing uh, this form, art form, architecture is, is is to build for people, and and I think in a similar way, I felt like as I alluded to earlier, like much of the architecture writing that I have read somehow didn't <clears throat> fail to address like the experience of living in a built environment, and um, and you know as I was embarking on this project of writing this book, I, you know at first I was approaching it sort of I was like am I writing a biography here is that what's happening and then I was like no I'm not a biographer that's not what I'm going to do I'm going to try and write really about my own experience of, of living in the built environment and to do that I really the only way to do that and to write the version that only I could write was to allow these other more personal parts of my life which I was very reluctant to do at first to sort of enter into the book. Um, and so that the result is, um, you know, it's telling your grandfather's story, but it is very much and sort of unapologetically from my perspective and in, within the context of other things that are happening in my life at the time. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to um, my grandfather, to Minoru, what was it about him that kind of intrigued you most and kind of, because I can only imagine the research that went into this book, because it is, it seems, if you want to talk a little bit about the research process too, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. But what was it that kind of drew you to him? And then what was it that you kind of, that kind of kept you going and intrigued you most about him and his work and also the time that he was working? Yeah, well, I mean, I think originally that it, it, I, my curiosity was sparked by just the obscurity, right? How, how yeah, this sort of right. monumental figure could have been, been sort of marginalized in the history 
uh, at least the history that I was taught. I, know, I mean, I think what your, your point that you made at the beginning about Detroit is a good one. There are places, there are sort of pockets where this work is much better known. Mm -hmm. But by and large, I, I feel very confident saying that he does not, he's not received the attention that, that he deserves um, generally. But also, but I think much more importantly than that, I, you know, I, I got so interested, you know, I, I had originally, this project begins and the book begins with the story of uh, art gallery flooding in 2012. And my, the, the, my experience for kind of pulling all this work, it was an art gallery that was owned by my wife, Jane, who's Nina in the book, and her partner, Janine, who's Danielle in the book. And um, much of the work that was damaged in the hurricane was work that was made by, not by me, but by very good friends of mine. And, and the sort of book begins with me pulling all of these objects out of the basement, um, you know, aware of the fact that this is a weather event that has completely destroyed real lives and, and wreaked real economic havoc. But, but my, finding myself preoccupied at the time with the sort of death of these objects and the awkwardness of making physical things as a way of communicating. And I think one of the, th I'm gonna, I'm getting somewhere here and, and that's it. One of the things I think about your, as, as I learned more about your grandfather and his process was just the passion with which he cared about the things that he was making and the things that he was putting out in the world and what he was trying to communicate with them uh, through them was so compelling and in so compelling in part because it didn't always come across, but that, but it doesn't always come across. That's what, that's the problem with making objects is you don't always, you're not always able to get the ideas out into the world. And I think that really drew me in, in addition to the sort of breadth of his work and, um, and also that how difficult it was to kind of figure out what was going on in his brain. Cause as you and I have talked about, the archive uh, includes a lot of information, but very little about what's happening inside this man's brain, which 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 was always intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about? I mentioned this earlier, but if you could just talk a little bit about kind of where you feel like his story fits in the context of like being, you know, one thing I've been moved on, moved about lately is I'm working on a picture book, a children's book about him too. And so I've been looking through tons of photo references, as you know, and um, I see lots of pictures of him in these meetings, you know, look around building models or around drawings or anything or in presentations. And it is always him surrounded in a room of all white men. And um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact, what you, what you perceive, you know, through your research, because you talk about it quite a bit in the book, of you know him as a Japanese American man, you know as he kind of came of age in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and what you feel like where you feel feel like that fits into his like architectural story. Sure, of course. I mean, I don't. Um, it's it completely defines the trajectory of his career and his life, and I think um, you know we architecture is not a historically diverse profession. And he was working at a time when there were very few architects of color working anywhere. Um, and, and I think that that, you know, you, know you, you, you brought this question up earlier about whether the, his marginalization was ultimately a, an issue of re result of racism. And I think the answer to that is not, can't only be yes. I mean, I think there are other factors that contributed to it. I think the fact this use the way in which he embraced ornament, uh, for example, was ran so against the kind of mainstream of, of American modernism at the time. But um, but you can never fully disentangle that from larger conversations about race. And I and and the the way in which your grandfather's story, which you know of course much more intimately than I do, it was defined by these brushes with these massive cultural forces at various times in his life, uh, you know, just makes the, the extent of his work, like how much he was able to produce given the circumstances in which he was working, so extraordinary, right? And I, and I think that one of the examples that you and I have talked about a lot is 
trying to imagine this, this experience of moving to New York in the depression to work as an architect and then um, marrying your grandmother on Friday, December 5th, 1941, spending the night dancing on the hotel of the Astor Hotel, the roof of the Hotel Astor, and then waking up on Sunday morning to find that the Japanese Navy has bombed Pearl Harbor and having the entire world shift beneath his feet. And, you know, because he was an extraordinary architect and a US citizen, he was able to continue working, but went to work immediately on, on a naval base in upstate New York, where he was like routinely turned away by the MPs at the gate because they thought he was a spy while simultaneously trying to help your great grandparents come to the East Coast to avoid being sent to internment camps. And that kind of complexity seems to define his, the path of his life and his career at all points. So, so it's everywhere, mm -hmm. if that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. And um, very much so. And I'm, you know, I'm interested too in just kind of how in the book you, you kind of run this story about 432 Park Avenue. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that and kind of why you wove it in with the story, a little bit about that, that building. I mean, some of the descriptions of that were the most hilarious to me for, to read. Um, but if you could just, yeah, talk a little bit about that and what the decision was to bring, why you decided to bring that in. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are in New York, 432 Park is a building designed by Raphael Vignoli that's an incredibly tall uh, square building on, on 57th Street, the first one, uh, the first very tall, skinny one. Um, and it, it, you know, the building sort of arrived, it came, it sort of inserted itself into the story because it was under construction during the time that I was writing the book. So that it's, you know, it's gradual progress became kind of a marker of time as I was writing. But it also, you know, at a time when I was thinking about the World Trade Center, uh, which was at the time the tallest building, tallest buildings in the world, watching this new building go up that was now going to be the tallest building in New York City, uh, Im just Im immediately put my own thoughts about the World Trade Center in a new kind of context. And I and the sort of simplest way to explain it, and the the sort of the way I talk about it in the book is. If you just imagine what the tallest building in New York means as kind of an index of where power resides over time, you know, originally that would have been a temporary Lenape hunting shelter that was then replaced by a Dutch fort, which is sort of a, a, a symbol of military power, later, later surpassed by churches like Collegiate and Trinity, which are still there. Then kind of capitalism builds the Woolworth Building, the Singer Building, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building. And the World Trade Center really is the product of a kind of confluence of private and public sector, right? We have Rockefeller and Chase working for the Port Authority to create these two massive towers. And now what, what occurred, what kept occurring to me to the book as I was watching this tower go up was that, you know, now the tallest buildings in New York are um, representative of sort of extraordinary private wealth. And, and I think that that was a kind of, index that helped kind of situate both the World Trade Center and, and 432 in history and also me in the sort of version of New York that I was living in. Yeah, that kind of um, makes me think about, you know, in the book, you're talking a lot about like, who are these things for, not just the buildings, but also kind of like the fine art. And then you talk about kind of like the um, health spaces, you know, this concept of like, um, sick buildings, but also the concept of kind of how architecture has been impacted by by health and by kind of safety. And and I'm wondering when it comes to like this movement of these buildings, like Vignoli's building and like buildings being built for extraordinary private wealth, like where do you see, what I see in Brooklyn, like all around us and also in different parts of the country are just kind of these um, high rises going up everywhere, you know, and they're luxury, but they're not necessarily like that much of luxury. But I wonder like, one thing we've talked about is how, um, you know, the media we consume, you know, the books we read, the music we listen to um, on all sides has been impacted by social justice movements. So like people who are writing books, people who are editors, people who are making TV shows, that's all evolving to be more representative of the world we live in. And um, I wonder where architecture is 
as far as that is concerned and if you feel like it's been impacted at all um, by these movements. Because I feel like a big strand of the book is like, who is this stuff for? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think, you know, one of the things, this is exactly what you're, you're talking about, but we've talked about this before, is that, you know, we are, there is a sort of reevaluation of the content that we're consuming, uh, be it film, music, literature, fine art. I, and it is remarkable to me that there hasn't yet been more attention paid. You know, if, if we're so indulgent as to call architecture an art form, you know, it is, it is this thing that we consume, but we have very little choice in what we consume. It's not like, you know, unlike a movie, which you can watch or not watch, you don't get to choose the building that you go to school in, the building that you work in, uh, 99% of the time, you don't get to choose the building that you live in, really. And so we are living within this form, but not really having um, a lot of conversations about who is controlling it and who is developing that content. And that's a, that's a question that exists within the world of architecture. It also, there, there are also some sort of top-down questions about um, that have to do with construction, development, and all that sort of stuff. But I, I, I do, I, I think an important part of the book is thinking more about who makes this content that we live within. Mm -hmm. So do you see that in architecture kind of evolving at all? Um, I know that like I've been a public school teacher for, I was for about 14 years. And when I was teaching art, it was kind of like when I had a promising, or like a kind of enthusiastic art student who was also really strong in math and in the sciences, their parents would often say, well, maybe they can be an architect. And I would always think like, oh, like that is a tough path. You know, we grew up around architecture and it was, you know, I always joke with my family, like we'd be at the office on Sundays with my dad and the office would be full you know, on a Sunday, they would say, do you want to be an architect? And I would say, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, I do wonder, you know, like, what is the path forward? Because clearly, you know, these spaces are so important. And um, when you think about, you know, I, I thought a lot about in your book, how you talked about, and we can talk about this a little bit in Prudigo, but like, it is a symbol of the failure of modernism. And, um, you know, the idea that like, any one thing could be the solution for everything. Um, mm. Like that, mm. that modern, you know, modernism was going to like make the world better through buildings and, and just that it, it could just be that one thing kind of seems so impossible. You know, like it reminds me of um, in my own, in my mural work, you know, a lot of the time I work with people from um, kind of very disenfranchised communities. And I work with a lot of young women of color. And a lot of the time people will say, oh, like, tell me about your participants, you know, tell me about your team and like, how was their life changed by this six week mural project? And I'll say, well, you know, they had a really good summer, it was a good job, but like, then they went back to their underfunded school and they went back to not having good healthcare. And they went, you know, so it's kind of like any one thing is not gonna be the entire solution just to, so I think that, you know, what I'm trying to get at here is just, um, how do you see, I, I don't know where architecture is currently and like if there are optimistic movements like there are in other industries, you know, in terms of thinking about humanism and thinking about people and who occupies these spaces. Because I think my grandfather, that was what he cared about so much was how people felt in the spaces they inhabited. And I wonder what's happening now, you know? Mm, yeah. There's, okay, I, I, I feel like I have sort of three different things I want to say about that. The first, I think, does let, let's let's start with your grandfather because I think that's a really important part of this book is that just he, you know, really was a modernist, and he really believed, I think, in the in the project of modernism as as you say, as this thing, this way of approaching architecture with the end goal of making the world a better place, you know, mm -hmm. and he had this. Um, incredible idealism in that regard, which, you know, may well have been his most modernist trade, because that's, you know, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> he also believed that modernism was sort of an incomplete project, that it had kind of gotten this, these structural rules right, and, but that it was failing in a fundama fundamental way to address the needs of the people who lived within the buildings. And I think that's a very important part of, of understanding his work. Um, as 
you know, that relates to these broader questions about architecture. Look, architecture moves very slowly. It's like, you know, it's a, it, 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 it's like a, an aircraft carrier kind of trying mm -hmm. to make this turn. And I think people are thinking now at a very high level about how to address um, these inadequacies in, within the profession and the built environment. But I also think it has to do, as you described perfectly in your visits to, to the office, you know, we, ha there ha we have to value architecture more in order to draw people in because if, you know, if the choice is to kind of enter a profession where you're working tirelessly and being underpaid for it, it you're, you're, it, you're, you're gonna, the best people are not necessarily gonna gravitate to that work. But on a much larger conversation and sort of much having more to do with what, what's happening now, Another subject of the book, it, it has to do with sick building syndrome and this idea of what happened, you know, if you think about the entire history of architecture as being sort of built on this ideal of the human body and kind of protecting the human body, it's sort of gradually losing touch with that objective over time until you get to this Reagan era kind of US moment in like the 80s and 90s when buildings are actually starting to become sick and that was a phenomenon that was largely kind of dismissed as hysterical or psychosomatic or something but it was really quite clearly the result of unregulated materials and more stringent you know ventilation controls I, I, I go into that in great detail in the book and we don't need to discuss it now but one of the interesting things about the sort of time frame in which this book has unfolded and come out is I think that in a strange way, COVID has really forced us to think about these issues more than we ever had before. And sort of the, I think it's, it's really heightened our awareness of, of how our bodies exist within an urban space and within an architectural space. And, and then I think it may have more, it may push these questions forward faster than anything else could because it's impossible not to be aware of how we exist in architectural space over the course of the last two years. Um, but yeah, I think also, and this is my, my final thought on that, although the sort of phenomenon of six building syndrome as a named idea has been largely dispensed with, I do think there are lots of instances uh, such as the 2017 fire at Grenfell Tower in London, which was the direct result of poorly regulated building materials or the collapse of the condos in Surfside that suggest a sequence of decision-making that is based on economic imperatives rather than addressing yeah. the needs of, of the occupants, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Which I, is sort um, of like another, Un, that's, it's an unwell way of thinking about building architecture, but. Right. Yeah, um, no, thanks for that. And I, I wanna just let people know that we'll be doing question, like a Q and A time in about five minutes. So if you have any questions you wanna put into that Q and A section, feel free to, to write them in there. And um, I appreciate, um, you know, one thing that's come up, especially recently because of the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is, everything is about 9-11 and everything is about the World Trade Center. And it's nice that we've kind of like talked about many other things besides that. But I do just um, personally and probably other people in my family have experiences too, where like I uh, was at an event at the Center for Architecture not too long ago. And, and this architect came up to me and he said, oh, Yamasaki, huh? And he said, Pruitt, I go in the World Trade Center. That's quite the legacy. And I remember thinking like, huh, like I'm just curious how you would respond to somebody who said that. Because like, to me, I'm, you know, I don't necessarily have the architectural language, but I'm curious, like, what would you say to somebody? Because, you know, clearly he had this very, these two very dramatic events in his career, um, but he had more than that, but two dramatically, literally explosive events in his career. And I wonder how you would respond. And because it's kind of like what I'm trying to do, like I know in my book, and I think what you do so beautifully in your book too, is kind of keep the focus on the intention of his work. Um, but I'd love for you to speak about that a little bit. Well, I mean, there's no denying that this extraordinary coincidence that mm -hmm. this person authored these two projects 
which for very different reasons, for circumstances that were completely outside of his control, happened to be basically demolished on television uh, in events that were separated by 30 years. It's really, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really incredible <laughs> thing and it's hard to move past that because, I, because architecture really, like architecture doesn't really produce events, right? And these are these two events that were incredibly well-documented, spectacularly well-documented and um, have had huge, or like have, have had huge impact on the, the trajectory of architecture. So you, you, know, you can't deny that completely, but, but one of the things, the sort of ironies of it is that they're probably the two buildings that were the least indicative of his style overall. And they're not representative, I, I don't think in any way of this larger body of work, which really was huge and significant and influential. And so I think that, um, you know, I understand that for many people that might be the point of entry. And, but, but, but it, hopefully it's a point of entry to understanding this much larger career and this mm -hmm. career that was, that was, you know, as you say, the intention was to do something so different than what these buildings came to represent. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, let that not necessarily be a bad thing as much as like an invitation to kind of learn more about this yeah. character and and what was going you know his, his, what was going on in his mind and how his intentions led you know through circumstances that didn't that he had very little control over to these two spectacular events right yeah wow. i know that the anniversary has been kind of so on everybody's mind and that was kind of an entry point with this book, just in terms of timing. But I, what I wonder is for you, like, what is the, um, you know, why is now the right time for Sand Future? Well, I think now, um, well, I think the, 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 any book about dealing with your grandfather's body of work, and now I'm, I, uh, there's mine, there is Dale's, there's going to soon be yours. Though they're all long overdue, they all should have been written thirty years ago. But I think it is. I mean, I, I find I find that you know the World Trade Center has come to symbolize something that is so dramatically different than what it was intended to signify and what your grandfather intended it to signify. And I think my hope um, in tying the release of this book to to this anniversary, uh, inauspicious as that may be is that by reading it, people can think somewhat differently about what those tower, what those buildings mean and what, what they symbolize. And that, that once you understand the incredible complexity of the life of the person who conceived of these two buildings, you can't help but see them in a slightly different light. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and what are your kind of, like, what's your next, what's your next thing? That, that you're gonna like, where do you go from here? Because I feel like this has been, oh, I, one thing though, I actually, before before we answer that, I'm just curious kind of um, what is your kind of takeaway in terms of like everything, not about my grandfather, but there's so much else in the book. You know, there's so much about kind of New York City and there's so much about um, power and there's so much, there's so much about politics and just all of these overlapping themes. And I think like, that's the other question about like, why is this for now? You know, because it's not, not just to do with my grandfather, but like the, the other, you know, that's maybe like one third of the book, but the, but the rest of the book. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, in a very strange set of circumstances that I was for, for years anticipating the anniversary of 9-11 as being kind of resonant, uh, touchstone for the release of this book. And then of course, two weeks ago, half the people I know in New York City had some major flooding event oh, yeah. uh, because of Ida. And that's where this book begins with a, with a real yeah. flood. And so in a way, in a strange way, both this question of flooding and, and, and which is directly related of course to climate change has really reasserted itself in all of our kind of collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, and the same, I think, is true of the of the threads of the book that deal with illness and building in, in relationship to 
to COVID. I, I can't take credit for anticipating either of those things. Uh, I think any reasonable person would have anticipated the climate change, but um, you know, I think I've been very lucky that it's sort of re it's resonant in ways that maybe I hadn't even anticipated. But I think that um, you know, hopefully, it will continue to be. Uh, in terms of your first question, I really don't. I, I can't say for sure at this point. Um, there's a, a few different projects kind of percolated, but. I imagine that this has changed. I should have anticipated that you were going to ask that question. Had like That's OK. No, I, I kind of have been changing my questions as we've gone along. But I kind of I wonder how writing a book like this and exploring these topics changes your relationship to thinking about objects. You know, and you make objects. So like just, you know, and just even from the beginning of the book, from Hurricane Sandy and from experiencing what you did with all of your friends' work, like, yeah, I can imagine that there would be a bit of a shift there. Yeah, I mean, I was really, I, I think I was really excited by the possibility of working in a, in a medium that was not so material, physical, cumbersome. Um, toxic. <laughs> and toxic, yeah, also true, right, which I talk about. And so, I don't, you know, that was really thrilling to kind of, it, mm -hmm. but, but I also think that, you know, as I got, this was initially just a kind of an experiment, and it became progressively clear as I moved forward with that experiment that the story that I was trying to tell in this project was needed to be a book, needed to be written. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, part of it was, was trying to move away from working in three dimensions, but also part of it was trying to kind of realize the project in its best possible form, mm -hmm. which in this case ha happened to be a book. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, I don't typically read architecture books cover to cover. You know, I know you always say nobody does, but I definitely don't. I read fiction and I read children's books. And I've been completely engrossed in the book. And I've also been really moved by the depth of your research across across genres, like you're in across subject matter. Um, it's been pretty amazing. And um, you know, I hope other people will pick up the book too. Um, it is beautifully designed, even though I don't have the final copy. Yeah, that's not even the real one. This is the, yeah, that this is yeah, beautiful object, really. Um, um, and I'm wondering if people have any questions that they'd like to ask. Um, it's it's funny to talk to somebody who knows more kind of data about your family than you do, um, just in terms of like years. I, I just know facts. <laughs> facts, right. But um, yeah, if anybody wants to ask any questions or anything like that. Otherwise yeah, and I before can... we do that, I also just want to like take a moment to really thank you, Katie, for your just being so helpful and so supportive in this project. It means the world to me. You just sort of appeared in my life as I was embarking on this. and. Uh, You've been my conduit to like a much larger family and a much larger history. And I'm really grateful for your- input. And my pleasure. Honestly, it's what a surprise. And you, nobody probably knows this, but Justin Justin lives on the, the street where my studio is. So that's kind of a right. funny, funny coincidence. But we do have a question from Sarah. Uh, Justin, is there anything you've learned through the process of researching Yamasaki's life and through analyzing so many buildings that you wish architects today would think more about as they design new buildings? It's a wonderful question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, it, it's, it sounds so dumb, but remember people are gonna use them, you know? Remember mm -hmm. people are gonna be inside them. And I think one of, the, you know, one of the things that's so complicated having been trained as an architect and work briefly as an architect is that, you know, you're in this, architecture is, is a, is a largely represented representational media, right? You're working with drawings and you're working with models and things like that. And I think that, um, you know, it's so important to, to kind of be in the physical world and think about how material feels, how spaces feel, how light works. And, um, you know, I, one of the things I have such tremendous respect for your grandfather is he was always so sensitive to that, you know? And so, I mean, that, that um, I don't want to, Go into a huge digression here, but you know this. There, I talk about this in the book. He, he was he was quite afraid of heights, right? So you have this person designing the tallest buildings in the world, who is trying to go to great lengths to make him make occupants feel comfortable in at that elevation. And you know, in the World Trade Center, he he literally used the dimension of his, old, of his own shoulders to kind of determine the width of the windows. And so he was constantly thinking about the experience of what it was like to be inside of a space. And I think that that. Um, I'm not saying that architects are not aware of that, but I think that it's an, it's an important thing not to lose sight of when you're in that 
representational space. Yeah, yeah, that's a great answer. Um, and Margo has, a, or Margaret has a question. Um, as this book works against the grain against um, of cultural amnesia, as well as the selective tradition, could you please share the importance of researching and publishing? Who is the ideal audience for this book and what are some of your hopes for its impact? Well, the, that's also a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that the ideal audience for this is, in, for this book is, and, and the audience that I was constantly kind of keeping in mind was an audience that would be broader than uh, the sort of defined architectural audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that we were trying to make this book uh, something that could appeal to somebody, you know, it's very dense, has a lot of information in it, but also kind of it can be accessible to sort of a, a more open-minded reader who might not necessarily be looking for architectural content. And, and, and that was a really important part of the editing process in particular to like kind of make the language uh, something that could, that, that wouldn't kind of stick it in this corner of architectural books. And we actually, I mean, even in the, you're, you're talking about the design, even the, this, the, the future, the, the San Future title, this idea of having a title that wasn't like a conventional subject colon thesis title, uh, that's more of like a novelistic title was sort of meant to communicate to the reader that what they're picking up might not be your average architectural mm -hmm. book. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was very much written with an audience in mind that was wider than kind of the architecture shelf at the bookstore. Okay. Um, any, I don't have any other questions right now, but I'm going to, um, I'm going I want to, Katie, I, I want to ask you a question just about your experience okay working on a very different kind of book about your grandfather from a very different position and just sort of what, how you've, I mean, has, how is that, you, you and I have talked about it, but I wonder how it's changed your perspective on the work. Well, um, you know, I, so for those of you who don't know, I'm a children's book author and illustrator. Um, and it's interesting to work on my grandfather's story because number one, I'm one of eight grandchildren. So like, I'm kind of working on, a story that is like, I feel like it's all of our stories, my whole family story. And um, it's one that, you know, I was in graduate school at nine, on 9-11 and right after that happened, people started saying, oh, you should do your grandfather's book, you could get published. And I was like, well, that's really gross. So I just kind of put it away for a long time. Um, and which is good because I kind of was able to build, I was always a little bit intimidated by his career as like an artist growing up. Um, I actually wasn't an artist growing up. I was uh, like more of an athlete and I kind of stayed away from art because I felt like, how can I live up to this kind of, you know, this kind of legacy? Um, and, you know, there's no compare, you know, like there's no kind of comparing in this case, but, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a, a tough book to work on because I care about it so much. And, um, and also it's been at a time, you know, working on it during the pandemic and working on it um, during this time of intense like Asian hate. And then, you know, learning all about the experiences he had as a Nisei man growing up, you know, trying to build his career during the depression and then going through the war and like both sides, his family and my grandmother's family, what they experienced during the war and then after the war and honestly, like all the way up. Um, so I think it's been a very, um, tough and emotional book to work on. And I'm kind of like in the throes of it right now. And so um, I hope, you know, I hope it's good, you know, and, but I, I think it's the book that I, I care about all my work, but I really care about this book and I care about it kind of on behalf of my family because, um, you know, he made a book about his own self, about his own work and his own life. And then, um, you know, my uncle Taro has done a bit, quite a bit of work around him and stuff like that. And then this is my turn kind of. And so I just feel like, I care about it because I'm making it for my family. Mm. Um, now we have a question from Sam. Um, uh, Justin's statement about the architectural world moving like an aircraft carrier. Many have sought to make modernist public spaces and design under threat of demolition. Um, the site of community action against developers that act against public interest to privatize public spaces, put garages over people, et cetera. Is community activism and action around public facing design not a way in which buildings can more effectively dialogue with societal changes in the here and now? I think it absolutely is. Um, I, I think that that has to, you know, I think um, 
that's a, a you know an essential component of this much larger conversation. Uh, you know, I think that especially writing from the position of New York, where um, developers are given kind of extraordinary control uh, and extraordinary power to build things. I mean, one of the reasons that 432 is so interesting is that it, the way, you know, it is uh, a feat of engineering, but it is a, it's like a triumph of zoning loopholes and the way that building kind of twists every regulation in its, in its favor to just add story upon story upon story um, just shows that that there needs to be some kind of reform in 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 zoning and ordinances and rules about development taxation everything so i think that to the extent that projects like the one you're describing uh, there's a number of projects that have, have happened on the site of prudigo for example that are great examples of that right raising awareness and drawing attention uh, yeah, absolutely essential. Yeah, that's, it reminds me of the conversation we were having recently about how a lot of developers and corporations are like lots of muralists. I know who I would never begrudge, you know, earning a good living, but a lot of these um, developers are hiring community muralists to paint murals on the sides of these new <laughs> luxury buildings that are going up because they've got these big blank walls and kind of an effort to make them feel like they're of the community, mm, which yeah. they are not, you know, this right. displaced how many people. So it's an interesting, that's a great question, Sam. Thank you. But I also think, you know, there's one, I, I, I went to get my COVID shot at the Javits Center. And so I was, afterwards I walked up in, into Hudson Yards when it was totally empty. And it was really remarkable to be in that space and to appreciate the extent to which it was created without any, seemingly any knowledge of the history of the World Trade Center, right? It's like, maybe it's, we've learned before that it's not a good idea for the city to make a terrible deal with developers, give away land, to have a huge open plaza facing the wind on coming off the Hudson River, to put like thousands of, hundreds of thousands of office, square feet of office space in a city that doesn't need them. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just re repeating all these mistakes that have been made before. And it's such a glaring example of, of just poor decision making and, and um, you know it's all all the writing was on the wall there so yeah yeah um, Justin do you have anything you'd like to say kind of in conclusion no I other than what you can I know there's been some some hiccups with ordering the book but I can issue with Greenlight has copies so if you want to order one I really encourage you to do it through Greenlight um, I also want to say that Katie before her book about her grandfather comes out next year she also has a book called Dad Bakes, it's coming out in a few months. Hopefully in a, in a month. It was supposed to come out yesterday, but right. they're having COVID related supply chain issues. It'll be out at the end of October. But keep an eye out for that. Um, thank you, Katie, so much. Thank you to the whole kind of extended Yamazaki family who checked in tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, also to Rosie and Sam, if you're still up. And thank you to everyone at Greenlight for, um, for doing this. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin and Katie, for such a fantastic conversation. And thank all of you for joining us tonight um, and connecting over this book. A reminder that you can order Sand Future through Greenlight, as Justin said. Um, you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com. And I'm copying that link into the chat um, for either local in-store pickup, if you're here in Brooklyn, or for shipping anywhere in the US. Um, you can also shop in person at Greenlight every day of the week from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, thank you all so much once again, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody.